Thanks very much, Jack. If you got in here in time to see the music video, that's uh, me in the music video with my band. That's Dr. Buzz and the Medicated Trio. And uh, so thank Jack a lot for uh, letting me come talk to you guys about uh, shoulder problems, something I've been interested in for a, a long time now. I, I, all I do is shoulders. And unless you've ever had shoulder pain, most people underestimate the disability uh, that patients go through and suffer with with, uh, with shoulder problems. This is part of a a Grand Rounds lecture that they say you can't get uh, met information into Harvard, but you can always get it out. But I actually gave this as a Grand Rounds at uh, MGH a number of years ago, so that's online. But I've lectured with a lot of guys from Harvard over the years, so I had to become an institute because I'm uh, Redneck Institute of Shoulderology Knowledge. That's me. Uh, we have an acronym like every other good institute, and that's RISK because that's what you're taking. And our motto has always been, if you're weak, nervous, or dizzy, it could be your shoulder. And if you have good insurance, it damn well is your shoulder. <laughs> uh, this is our poster that we have on uh, Southwest Airlines magazine. Life is painful, your shoulder doesn't have to be. The, uh, in the middle it says, this man has one cavity. <laughs> so if you think that's funny, you ought to go to my YouTube site, Dr. Buzz. You can see all the YouTube videos, including that's one bone I don't fix, uh, which is a song more about Viagra than uh, uh, anti-inflammatory medications. And then if you really are insomniac and you really can't go to sleep, you can watch this crazy thing I did for a couple of hours at Harvard one time. So this is from, uh, you know you've really arrived when uh, your, your profession is cartooned uh, in the newspaper. So this is uh, Snoopy's evil uh, twin. And he says, I, I bet it's anything I can't. I'm not a doctor, but I bet it, it's anything. It's your, your rotator cuff. And the problem is, is this is more common with orthopedic surgeons uh, to make these kind of knee-jerk reactions. But if you jump to conclusions uh, in making diagnosis, especially in the uh, field of musculoskeletal pain, you can uh, really make some big mistakes. So this is a 50-year-old endodontist who came to me, had pain for about five months, uh, started after a tennis game, a typical uh, rotator cuff kind of history. He'd had x-rays at his PCP. Uh, two months prior to me seeing him, they were negative. He, he knows he has a rotator cuff. He, he says, just give me a cortisone shot. I don't want to have any other uh, x-rays uh, at all. Just give me a cortisone shot. I'll get back about my business. So if anybody can see, uh, sorry. Figure out where the pointer is on this thing. So any, anybody, anybody in the audience see anything wrong with these x-rays? I found it. I found it. Probably too hard to see from back there, but if you if you look carefully, there's a subtle area here in his uh, metadiaphysis of his humerus. Just doesn't look quite right for a 50 year old. Looks a little bit of endosteal scalloping there, if you will. And so I ordered an MRI scan. He had a <clears throat> non-smoker's uh, carcinoma of the lung. So about four years later, I was at my endodontist office, and he said, "There's somebody here that wants to thank you." And I. They had worked me in the day before because I'd broken a tooth, so I'd sent lunch to his uh, office staff, and I thought it was just somebody from his office staff that was going to come in and thank me for lunch, but it was actually this individual coming in thanking me for saving his life, so uh, making a big difference in people's lives. Anybody in the audience know who this is? Check the cultural information. Anybody raise their hand? Ringo Not Ringo Starr. Raise, hand raise here. Still didn't hear it. Really loud. No. This is Dr. Gachet. This is uh, Vincent Van Gogh's psychiatrist. He was a great listener. He was a shitty psychiatrist <laughs> because uh, Vincent was staying at his pension when he walked out into the fields where he'd painted all of the uh, dark birds coming at him and shot himself. And he actually would have survived had uh, Dr. Gachet not kept him in his house for three days instead of taking him to Paris where he could have uh, had surgery to remove the bullet. But he was a great listener, and the Gachet family ended up with all of Vincent van Gogh's paintings. His brother Theo, who, who uh, really supported him, got one painting. So they got about $800 million worth of paintings. So it really makes sense to be a good listener, and maybe you'll be uh, like Dr. Gachet and really look out. So these are things that are really anathema almost to orthopedic surgeons. That's taking a history and spending any time with a patient other than in the operating room with a bovie in your hand. So you have to take a family history, strong family history suggests ligamentous laxity. You know, this is a 
autosomal dominant trait, so everybody in the family is going to have uh, a, uh, a gene for this, and so they'll have instability uh, in every generation of their families. You have to take a social history. There are young people who use their shoulders that can voluntarily dislocate their shoulders uh, to get their parents together, to get attention, to get out of things that they don't want to do. And then we know that stress exacerbates these things that are kind of the bane of probably yours and my existence, uh, fibromyalgia, fibrositis. So you have to take a social history as well. And then you have to figure out what does the patient want to do. So uh, you, do they just want to sit and play the guitar? Do they have to roll a rock up uh, every day? This is, I always like this myth of Sisyphus because Albert Camus said in the end, Sisyphus probably was really satisfied because at least he had something to do all day. This is, this is how I feel at, at, the, uh, at the end of clinic almost every day, like Sisyphus, and i got to go back the next day, roll the rock back up. So it's important to take a review of systems, especially sleep, in the shoulder, because if anybody's ever had shoulder problems themselves or taking care of a lot of patients, this is the hardest thing to do. You cannot sleep in your bed. You cannot sleep flat. You cannot roll over on your shoulder. If you have bilateral shoulder problems, you can't sleep flat and you can't roll off that area. And these patients will get so sleep deprived that they will get clinically depressed and even sometimes suicidal. So I was an art major my first year in college. That's why I have some art in this, but this shows uh, someone resting comfortably on Henri Matisse on the left, and then Picasso's. This is a woman who's been up with shoulder pain, just sitting in a chair all night, uh, just waiting for the uh, sun to come up. So I think I always try to get orthopedic surgeons to treat their patients for depression, probably uh, harder than you would think, or maybe impossible. But uh, that doesn't mean that you can't uh, be the world's best doctor and treat your uh, patient's depression. And the other way to be the world's best doctor is just to kill as few patients as possible. And if you've never read this book, it's a cute little uh, book uh, by uh, Oscar London. This is the Sistine Chapel. This is uh, the descent of, of Adam. And so sometimes at the end of the day in clinic, I feel like this too, just being dragged down by all these patients and their, their problems. But I'm almost always, I give, I give out some of my own CDs. I always give one to the patient who makes me feel least sorry for myself. And I see some patients who have just horrible problems. A lady I saw last week had a melanoma, wide local excision, a chylus leak for a year, radiation, then got leukemia. I mean, you know, really, this is, these patients have terrible problems. And she's there, and the thing that's bothering her most right now is her shoulder pain, and she just cannot sleep. Uh, so you have to lay on hands. This is Auguste Rodin's uh, hands. and. Again, and then this is really hard for orthopedic surgeons. You have to actually think about what, uh, what is going on and try to put all these different disparate pieces of information together. So some days at the end of the clinic, I feel like Groucho Marx on the left. I'm so happy. I've really done a great job. And sometimes I feel like I'm the wound mannequin on the right that I've just been totally beaten up by this. But what makes the diagnosis difficult? Well, the, Again, you have to listen, and you have to see the patients several times, usually. And then you got to remember there are a lot of, of structures in the, uh, that are, uh, generate fairly similar kinds of pain in different areas. So you, the shoulder girdle really consists of the sternoclavicular joint, or the clavicle, the AC joint, the scapula, this so-called bursa between the scapula and the ribs, which is sometimes almost considered like a joint, an articulation. You've got the uh, humerus, the glenoid, the acromion, the rotator cuff, you've got all the soft tissues in between. You've got all these different little bursi. You'll see patients a lot of times pain with a superior aspect of their uh, scapula. It's not always fibromyalgia. There is a little bursa that occurs right there where your trapezius kind of goes over that uh, portion of your scapula to attach to the spine of the scapula. And then just within the glenohumeral joint, there are all these other different structures like the biceps, all four of the rotator cuff tendons, the labrum, and then there's the articular surfaces of the uh, glenoid and the humerus that can get arthritic. The other thing that makes a shoulder diagnosis difficult is there's a, the shoulder is really a circle, and so it, you can't really break anything with, uh, that's circular with just an injury on one side. And so a lot of times there's injuries on two sides. And the other thing that is difficult is that sometimes the symptomatology on one side masks where the real anatomic problem is. And then you can get patients who have multiple different types of problems at the same time. They can have AC joint arthritis. They can have rotator cuff issues. They can have C5-6. And the, probably the most common 
combination, you see your patients have C5-6 radiculopathy and some sort of uh, true shoulder pathology as well. And so my job oftentimes is to try to sort out which one of those is the biggest uh, problem. The other thing that is, makes diagnosis difficult is that these symptoms sometimes change over time. And so somebody may come in with shoulder pain and a full range of motion, and it's a woman and she's in her 40s. And if oftentimes what will happen in a doctor's office, an orthopedic's office, she'll get a subacromial injection. That may help her temporarily, but sometimes she'll have so much pain just as a steroid type of flare, she'll quit moving her arm for just two or three days, and then she goes into a full-blown frozen shoulder. Well, that's what she had early on. That's, that was what her original pathology was. The frozen shoulder just starts as this incredible inflammatory reaction in the glenohumeral joint. Some of it's sympathetically mediated. If you look at frozen shoulder and what we used to call RSD or complex regional pain syndrome, they're exactly the same. Their bone scans hot, the same type of people get these same problems. Uh, and so, but early on, a patient with adhesive capsulitis won't have a stiff shoulder. They'll have a full range of motion. They'll have night pain. They'll have pain, especially when they try to fasten their bra in the, uh, in the morning to get dressed. But they can have a, a full range of motion. So if you follow that patient over a period of time, and you warn them that you know they may be in, at risk for getting stiff, and they, if they have pain after an injection, please, please keep your shoulder moving, then you can avoid this. But if you don't really consider that, then oftentimes I see patients where this exact same scenario has happened, and they come in and they almost always are blaming their uh, uh, physician, saying that he made me worse. You know, everybody has taught, talk about pancos tumors as causing shoulder pain. Uh, gallbladder disease, uh, obviously on the right-sided periscapular pain, and we'll kind of go through some of these. Peripheral nerve entrapment, a lot of people don't realize how much shoulder pain you can get just from simple carpal tunnel. One of the most painful conditions, we'll talk about syndrome of Parsonage and Turner. And then you can get anything that involves the diaphragm, whether it's the lower portion of your lung or on your liver or your spleen, can uh, give you referred pain into your shoulder. The AC joint is one of my particular areas that I've been interested in, and it's, I call it the great mimicker. There's basically three separate nerves that go to the AC joint. So sometimes AC joint patients will have pain in the posterior aspect of their shoulder, sometimes down their arm, but oftentimes up into their neck, and it will really mimic cervical uh, disc disease. And I've seen patients over the years have had two or three cervical disc disease, uh, cervical fusions, who only, all they need was really a simple either cortisone shot in their AC joint or a simple distal clavicle excision. But I always tell patients about this great mimicker. I say, well, you know, at least it's your AC joint. The other great mimicker is syphilis. And so if you're going to have something, it's better to have uh, AC joint arthritis than, than syphilis anyway. Uh, so the location of the pain is, is important. Where do they feel the pain? And this is a colleague of mine, Christian Gerber from Switzerland, who did this study took about 16 orthopedic residents and injected them with hypertonic saline in different parts of their shoulder, including the AC joint and the subacromial bursa to try to map where this pain is. So you, you really gotta wanna be an orthopedic surgeon uh, in Switzerland because uh, five of the people passed out while they were doing this. But he proved something that I already knew without having to torture somebody, that the AC joint will give you this pain that goes up into your trapezius, up into your neck. It'll also give you pain all the way down into your thumb. So again, it can be confused with a carpal tunnel. So you've got to do a neurologic examination if you're going to examine someone's shoulder properly. It used to be estimated that about 70% of patients with shoulder pain had pain that emanated from their cervical spine. Uh, but again, you need to check their reflexes and you need to check the uh, anatomic dermatomes where the uh, autonomous uh, sensory zones are for these uh, particular nerve roots. And you'll see patients that you think may have fibromyalgia, fibrositis, they have tenderness along the periscapular border. But if you look at this homunculus on the left, you can see that that's where uh, these nerve roots go by. So in this area where we're pointing there, this patient has a thoracic disc herniation. And so, again, severity of the pain, length of the time they've had it, if it's chronic, it's more likely that. If it's acute, it may be shingles. So uh, they may not even have bl uh, blisters yet. So there's just a lot of different things you got to consider when you see the shoulder. So these are the little different areas where patients, are not, you know, oftentimes patients say it's my shoulder, 
And, and when I think of shoulder, I think of this part of their arm, but very commonly patients think of it more as their shoulder blade or their, or their chest even. But all of these are considered uh, by the patient as a source of shoulder pain. And so if they have pain that occurs when they walk uh, you know, fast for 20 minutes and then when they sit down, the pain goes away, it's not their rotator cuff. And believe it or not, I've even had arguments with a cardiologist over this. I said, this patient has this is ischemic heart disease. This is not rotator cuff disease. And he said, I, oh, that's bullshit. That's, that's, this guy's heart's perfectly fine. Well, we put him on a stress test. The guy had an MI while he was getting his stress test. Fortunately, he was at the hospital to get cath and have his life saved. But, you know, if you, uh, if you have pain after you eat fatty foods, if anybody goes to Joe T. Garcia's tonight, which is here in Fort Worth, which is where I'm going, if you have pain after you eat an enchilada, it's not your rotator cuff, it's your gallbladder. So a lot of people have heard of the impingement syndrome, trying to describe this. There's a lot of different kinds of impingement. Subacromial impingement is the one that's the most common. And we describe these three different types of shapes of the acromion. And some of these are acquired. Some of them are uh, developmental. So uh, th very commonly, this shape, the type 3, is also associated with acromial convicted joint arthritis. So you get these large spurs that grow down from the AC joint that as you go, as you track medially, they become spurs. So the, you have to remember that the rotator cuff has to pass up underneath this arch of bone every time your arm is elevated. And in certain positions, there's contact between the acromion and the greater tuberosity and, and contact where the rotator cuff uh, is uh, inserted. Another kind of impingement that's less commonly recognized is coracoid impingement. So here's the coracoid process. It sticks out from the scapula like a thumb. Here's the humeral head. And you can see how narrow this distance is. Normally this distance is about uh, 10 to 12 millimeters. When it gets down to 8.7 millimeters, that's the critical distance for this to occur. And the, this causes uh, tears in the subscapularis tendon on the inner surface of the subscapularis. But these patients will have tenderness right on their coracoid process. Slap lesions are something that we are going to hear less and less about over the years. It was a hugely popular diagnosis, the, the most overdiagnosed and the most over-treated over condition in America for a number of years. And there were a lot of uh, patients out there now who had slap repairs who now have arthritic shoulders. Uh, is there cer certain degrees of laxity? So. Here's the labrum that surrounds the shoulder, sorry. So here's your, here's your uh, glenoid labrum. You see the slap stands for superior labral anterior to posterior. So here's our uh, tear. So I can't, I can't see where the, okay. A green one, oh. or, or I may have just, or we may turn the whole thing off. Anyway, you don't really need to know all, all about this, but the treatment now is, is considered to just r remove the biceps from the labrum. We know that the biceps pulling on that tissue, so regardless of these different types, which really aren't germane to your practices, the treatment is to tenodes the biceps. And I got the nickname Biceps Buzzy when I was a shoulder fellow because I suggested that a patient uh, have uh, had biceps tendonitis in my boss at the time didn't believe in that and he told me he was going to uh, put me on a Greyhound bus and send me to Duke to be a dermatologist because that uh, they kept a slot in the dermatology program for smart asses like me uh, that would question uh, that this but th clearly the biceps pain and biceps pathology were described even probably even before rotator cuff pathology but we can look at the biceps and this is where the mistake is made a lot of times back in the days we did a lot more open surgery Biceps looks pristine. This is the shoulder. That's the biceps going up into the biceps groove. The rotator interval has been released over that area, this area anatomically. And then um, it looks pr pristine, looks perfect. But if you take that biceps and you flip it over, you can see, especially if they have this kind of uh, attritional spur right in their groove, that you get this tremendous wear in the biceps. So these patients will have pain directly anteriorly and I'll show you where, where to actually touch the biceps to, to determine uh, where that pain is coming from. So this other thing is, that's interesting to me is this whole condition of fibromyalgia, fibrositis, myofascial pain syndrome. I looked up, and, and last year there were 977 pages 
uh, in PubMed that were from about fibromyalgia, only 51 for glenohumeral osteoarthritis. And so what a, a colleague of mine at the medical school here at Southwestern did was to look at the pathoanatomy of some of these patients. What he found was this kind of abnormal looking, he called it a spindle cell, but it's a spindle cell that's a myofibroblast, not one that occurs in your uh, bone marrow. It's very similar to uh, ischemic or proliferative uh, fasciitis. And so this is a, kind of this uh, abnormal looking cell that gets trapped in there. And these patients, I know probably the bane of your existence, they usually respond temporarily to, to trigger point injections, but you can, in patients that are intractable, you can actually go in and just do a fasciectomy, and you don't have to make this big of an incision to do it, and you could probably do, and most of these patients will have three or four trigger points, one here, one here, one here, sometimes in the lat, and if they're intractable and they get good temporary relief from injections, and they, it goes on for years and years and keeps coming back, because oftentimes this can kind of wax and wane, and always make sure you treat their sleep disturbance, because all these patients have a, an identifiable uh, sleep disturbance where they don't get into the alpha sleep, their muscles fully never fully re relax, but you can go in there and just do a simple fasciectomy on these patients. And I've seen patients that had you know, pain for 20, 30 years, been all over the world trying to get somebody to help them. And th again, this is simple outpatient kind of surgery. Uh, we talked about seeing the patients, giving the thorough history, doing a good physical, doing selective injections, and then you have to do all of the, uh, the correlation. So trapezial pain, AC joint, cervical spine, or neurogenic pain, uh, periscapular pain, fibromyalgia, fibrositis, cervical spine, scapular, uh, snapping scapula syndrome. This is uh, an organic cause of, sc of snapping scapula. This is an osteochondroma on the inferior aspect of the scapula. It gives you a much more dramatic type of crepitance than the usual scapulothoracic bursitis. When patients come in and see me, they have bilateral shoulder pain. This is what I always tell my own fellows to do. This is the one disease you gotta make sure that you don't miss right here. And I see probably five patients a year who've either seen their internist or referred to me by their internist who have polymyalgia rheumatica, and I'm the one that has to order the sed rate and the C-reactive protein to diagnose that on these patients. And so the reason, uh, and, and everybody in this room will absolutely know this, but this is the problem, and I'll tell you a story. I saw a patient, classic, sed rate was 60, 55-year-old woman, gave her oral steroids after I got her blood test, said, you gotta see your internist, you need to see a rheumatologist. She was, the, rheumat the internist didn't continue her steroids, and she went blind in one eye on the way to her uh, rheumatologist appointment a month later. So you've got to be, tr you gotta treat these patients, because they've got a severe medical problem that is much worse than the problem that they have in their shoulders. The syndrome of Parsonage and Turner, this was described in Lancet in the late 40s after an epidemic of uh, pneumonia and, and the flu uh, in uh, military uh, folks that were basically waiting around in England to come back to America after the war. So uh, this is one of the most painful conditions that you'll ever see. I was at my office one Saturday morning, actually, I was working on this talk to give at the Curl and Job Clinic in Los Angeles, and this guy showed up, and back then our our office wasn't in a really great part of town, so he's knocking on the door, so I've been trying to get in here for three weeks, I need somebody to help me, so this is Dr. Carroll who founded my clinic, sorry, uh, anyway, he, uh, I let him in, and sure enough, it was Troy Aikman's agent, so I got uh, cowboy tickets for a long time, but again, it's always, always open the door, keep the door open, but Dr. Carroll founded Scottish Rite Hospital, I figured what would Dr. Carroll do, he'd let this guy in, uh, and so sure enough, that worked out. Carpal tunnel, if their shoulder pain gets worse when they keep their hand in this position, it's not their rotator cuff. It's likely their carpal tunnel. The degree of trauma, and you'll see these patients like this patient who has factitious shoulder pain. This woman broke a steel case chair, believe it or not. And so she had a suit against the steel case chair company, and she would come in with these recurrent bruising, and I thought this could be some sort of avascular or some sort of uh, arteriovenous malformation. I didn't want quite sure what it was, but when they videotaped her, they found out that her mom would hit her about five days before every uh, appointment, so this bruise would, would continue. So if things don't fit, then you gotta really start uh, 
thinking about other really uh, psychopathology. So you want to examine the shoulder in, with uh, an outfit like this where you can see both shoulder blades, not like this. You've got to be able to move the arms. This is obviously a wing scapula. You look at their shoulder attitude. You look for different things on their skin. Ecchymosis, rubor, previous scars, radiation changes. Look for swelling. This is an AC joint a ganglion, a large a cystic mass over the AC joint filled with gelatinous fluid from the uh, capsular weakness there. And then the worst kind of atrophy you're going to see are in patients who have brachial plexus injuries. Then you have to palpate different areas. So we're going to palpate the AC joint, the greater tuberosity, the bicipital groove. Uh, and then there's Waddell's test for the shoulder, which Waddell's test for the spine, a lot of people are familiar with. It's just a, a sign of malingering or someone who wants secondary gain. But Waddell's test for the shoulder is actually just tenderness over the sternoclavicular joints. Uh, but if they have sternoclavicular joint arthritis, it's probably not a positive Waddell's test. They probably just have tenderness for a real good reason. So be careful on the AC joint. Don't just feel the top of the AC joint. It's a circular structure, so you feel the back, the front. And interesting, the AC joint a lot of times doesn't cause pain with tenderness, or it doesn't have tenderness, but if the patient hasn't been using their shoulder a whole lot, they, they'll be almost asymptomatic. Uh, but you can do some certain provocative positions. This is the coracoid right in the very front of the shoulder. You'll see that in patients who have a brachial neuritis. You'll see it with this coracoid impingement. And then Codman's point is this point just anterior to the uh, chromion here where the supraspinatus tendon is. Uh, Ernest Amy Codman was a, a, a shoulder surgeon at Harvard in the early part of the last century, and he was kicked out of Harvard. He's really the inventor of the um, level one uh, follow-up study, and he uh, demanded that the people at Harvard actually follow their patients. He started the first tumor registry, but for uh, recommending that they follow their patients and figure out what happened, he, he got fired. Ended up uh, bankrupt, but we our uh, society, Shoulder and Elbow Society, we put a, a headstone on his grave, and now he's been recognized by the American Cancer Association. So, really interesting fellow. Bicipital groove tenderness, if you just about three inches below the acromion. And the way I diagnose uh, biceps tendonitis in the groove is I have the patient move their arm while my finger's there, and usually the pain will go away once the biceps rotates out. The biceps is going to rotate with the humerus. So if you have point tenderness here and it doesn't change, that's usually just an anterior subacromial bursitis. But if that point actually moves or it maximizes in this position of about 15 degrees of internal rotation, that's very commonly uh, your biceps. So range of motion, we're going to do active and passive range of motion. We're going to look for painful arcs. Uh, abduction is something that we don't, we measure it we don't get a lot of patients to do it. it. Most patients use their shoulder in this position of, they call it scaption or uh, elevation in the plane of the scapula. So that's something that we are more likely to measure in our offices. External rotation can be measured either at the side or in abduction. So for throwers, we measure it in abduction because, again, that's an important measurement for them. Internal rotation can be measured uh, in abduction as well, but it's probably better measured down here like this with the thumb to whichever representative spinal segment it is. So this is about T9 is right where that portion of your scapula is. So we usually list that as a uh, location going from the greater trochanter to the lumbar sacral junction uh, up the lumbar spine to the thoracic spine. Again, external rotation, here it is at the side. These are good stretching exercises, have patients stretch into doorways. This is external rotation in the side. Again, external rotation in abduction, more important for uh, throwers. It's interesting that the AC joint doesn't really get loaded until the very highest apex of your arc. So you have a what's called a subacromial painful arc, which occurs from about 90 to 120 degrees. And then this painful arc for the AC joint is up here in this higher uh, range. So if we look at fixed loss of motion, patients with osteoarthritis that finally lock in their shoulders, they have basically equal active and passive motion. Patients with adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder have passive and active motion that's diminished equally. Uh, rotator cuff tears, patients with early arthritis, 
other conditions, instability of the shoulder, they frequently have a lag between their active and passive motion. So they may have full passive motion, but they don't always have active range of motion. The easiest test to do, whether it's their neck or their shoulders, ask them, does it hurt more when you move your neck from side to side? If, you, if they move it ipsilaterally, that's cervical disc disease. That increases the pressure on your disc and uh, causes more pain. You can do a simple traction maneuver like this to relieve their pain. Their range of motion can be diminished. It can be, look very similar if you look at these two patients, but this patient here has a spinal accessory nerve palsy, and that's why he can't lift his arm any farther than that, whereas the rotator cuff tear patient on the right has a different pattern. So you've got to make sure that the, the, the maneuvers cause that patient's pain and, and the pain that they came in with. This is the liftoff test. This is for subscapularis pair. This is Frank Job himself doing the Job test, the empty can test for supraspinatus testing. And speed tests, we see this in both biceps pathology and pathology in the anterior part of the rotator cuff. Jorgensen's test for the biceps, tenderness right there in the biceps groove when you supinate and flex your arm. If you've, the slap lesion test, this is Steve O'Brien doing his test. Again, cross-body adduction can give you pain with a tight capsule or AC joint. Again, AC joint don't rely strictly on the point tenderness. And then scapular winging is brought out by doing a push-up. So we do injections oftentimes in our office to try to uh, sort this out, and uh, we won't belabor that point. But I did come up with something called the bee sting test, uh, just to put the bevel of this needle up to a certain point and ask them to give you a one to 10 rating, and that'll give you a denominator for your pain scale. Imaging studies, we all look at our own images. This is again, like someone who was diagnosed with adhesive capsulitis, but you can see by the time you can see this uh, MFH, it's way too late. This is a lady with an isolated metner scapula, looks just like this fellow with AC joint arthrosis. And I think you can tell a lot about the patients by who comes with them. This is five people from Mahia, Texas that are in this lady's Bible study class that all came to Dallas. It's July and they're in an air conditioned car. Uh, and so that's how much they love this patient. So I would try to treat all the patients the same, whether it's getting somebody a myoelectric arm or getting them back to where they can play baseball and make a lot of money. And you can change lives as an orthopedic surgeon for better or for worse. This is before surgery at risk here on the left and then after surgery at the Redneck Institute here. Changed their baby's life and even changed their dog's life. Thank you very much for your attention.